is resumed. It's time now for questions to the Minister of Justice, and we will start with listed questions. And I call Gemma Dolan. Uh, question number one. Worryingly, there are on average six domestic homicides each year in Northern Ireland, with a domestic abuse incident every 17 minutes. Each domestic homicide is a tragedy, and behind every statistic there is a person with family and friends whose life has ended in traumatic circumstances. I want to do all I can to prevent this happening in the future. I intend to introduce domestic homicide reviews locally in the autumn, a recruitment exercise to identify suitable individuals to chair the domestic homicide reviews will be finalised in the coming weeks. Once appointed, we will ensure the chairs have access to a period of appropriate training before commencing the reviews. The chairs will work alongside a multi-agency panel to see what issues can be learned from these tragic cases and to prevent future abuse and deaths. It's hoped to begin the reviews during the autumn. Gemma Dolan, supplementary. I thank the Minister for her question, um, as that's an issue that has affected my own constituency. Um, paragraph 6.10 of the consultation document on domestic homicide reviews stated that the Department do not intend the DHRs to cover death by suicide. Concerns have been raised at this by a number of bodies, including the Attorney General and the Policing Board. Will the Minister commit to including death by suicide within the remit of domestic homicide reviews? The issue in terms of domestic uh, of, uh, suicide um, is a complex one in terms of being able to submit it um, to a domestic homicide review because in order for a homicide review to take place, the case has got to have gone to court and therefore it can be very difficult unless it can be proved that there was coercion or force involved um, in the suicide for that to happen. In the case of homicide suicide cases, um, they are going to be used for refinement purposes as we develop the tools for domestic homicides um, and they will be included when they're introduced. But in the case of a suicide on its own, um, it wouldn't be appropriate for a homicide review simply because it won't have gone through the court system. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I welcome the introduction of the domestic homicide reviews. Minister, can you inform the House whether or not uh, there will be opportunities for uh, learning from other jurisdictions and for best practice, and how will research be incorporated into the review? Well, I think, first of all, we are aware that these domestic homicide reviews are happening in other regions, and it's one of the reasons why uh, we have decided um, to introduce them here. They were originally introduced in England and Wales in 2011 um, under Section 9 of the Domestic Violence, Crimes and Victims Act 2004. Um, that legislation also provides Northern Ireland uh, in the form of a commencement order, and that's what we're hoping to bring forward um, in autumn. In terms of learning, the, impo the importance, is, I think, of the thematic report being published every two years to reflect on what has been delivered and to highlight improvements in practice will also be critical in terms of preventing um, future offending and also hopefully bringing learning to those justice partners um, who are either first responders or potentially engaged with families ahead of such tragic circumstances taking place. And I call Alan Chambers. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, Minister, given that in the case of deaths while under the care of the health service are reviewed by those responsible for that care, the hyponatremia deaths being a prime example, does the Minister believe that there is a place for our justice system in these morbidity reviews? Well, the issue um, of hyponatremia falls well outside the scope um, of a question on domestic homicide. It would be a matter for the Minister of Health to take forward any investigation um, in that regard. And I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister also for the answers provided to, to this point? And can I ask the Minister if she could outline the timescales for the introduction of the Domestic Abuse Bill? Um, with respect to the domestic abuse bill itself, um, the intention is that it will be brought to the committee, um, and we are intending to do that ahead of recess um, at Easter. Um, so with a fair wind, that should happen, because we are just waiting for um, Legislative Council to sign off on the bill, and that should then go through the executive process and hopefully be with the committee um, ahead of recess. After that, it will really be in the hands of the executive, the committee and the Assembly how quickly uh, we are able to progress that. But I would be very keen to see this introduced as quickly as possible. 
There is a commencement period required in order for us to have the training um, in place for justice partners who will actually be delivering um, around those issues. Um, that can, as we have discussed with other jurisdictions, take up to a year. But we have spent some time um, talking to other uh, partners about how we could reduce some of that delay in order that we make um, the domestic abuse legislation operational um, at as early a juncture as possible. And I call Carmen Mullen. Uh, question number two. Tackling antisocial behaviour and the negative impact which this type of behaviour has on communities is a priority for this executive. That's reflected in the current draft programme for government, which outlines our commitment to improve community safety by tackling antisocial behaviour through a review of legislation. My department carried out a consultation in 2018, inviting public opinion on a number of legislative proposals aimed at addressing antisocial behaviour, with particular emphasis on behaviours linked to the consumption of alcohol in public places. 50 responses were received from a range of interested parties. In summary, there was broad support for consideration of additional powers to deal with noise nuisance, seizure or confiscation of alcohol in designated places, um, and the closure of premises, both residential and business, associated with disorder or nuisance. Opinions were more divided on the introduction of criminal behaviour orders, which replaced antisocial behaviour orders on conviction in England and Wales, and public space protection orders, which provide powers for local authorities to deal with nuisance or problem behaviour by imposing conditions on the use of public areas. A full summary of responses was published on the Department's website in December 2019. A recurring theme from respondents was the requirement of any additional information to inform further consideration of future legislative proposals and the requirement for a swift and effective multi-agency response to nuisance and inconsiderate behaviour. My officials have started commencing a scoping exercise to identify how successful some of the proposed legislative changes have been in England and Wales. They are setting up a multi-agency working group to consider the findings from the consultation, as well as an evidence base in managing an operational response to antisocial behaviour. This will include whether there is sufficient legislation already in place and whether additional powers are necessary. Recognising the benefits of non-legislative approaches, work is also underway with key partners who lead on operational responses through ASB forums to better connect strategic policies and operational work to improve the delivery of targeted early intervention in local areas. Aaron Mullen, supplementary. Thank the Minister for her answer. Um, and, uh, you've touched on it there, but could you identify the stakeholders whom your department are engaging with at a community level? Um, most who are most impacted by persistent anti-social uh, behaviour? Well, I think that there are a number of ways um, that we have been engaging with stakeholders through things like the Northern Ireland Safe Community Service uh, Survey, which was previously the Northern Ireland Crime Survey, asking people about their perceptions of crime. And so we have been doing direct um, contact um, with, with the public. However, we're also working together with other partners, including, PC, uh, including PCSPs, with the police and with community and voluntary sector organisations, the Northern Ireland Housing Executive um, around uh, the work that they do in community safety strategy um, and also uh, looking at the draft policing plan and particularly the work of the police in terms of crime prevention strategies. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, does the Minister not agree that in tackling antisocial behaviour is not just legislation alone, but it requires a multi-agency response and what work is being done to deliver that multi-agency response? Well, I thank the member for his question, and I think that kind of picks up where the previous um, question left off. I think that there are a number um, of areas where we actually need a multi-agency response, but also, I think, across different departments. So, for example, issues around alcohol, which is a, per a persistent issue that's raised, is one where I'm working with the Department of Communities um, to look at the issues for seizure, because what we want to ensure is that alternative solutions, for example, to improve the operation of current council bylaws, um, are more effective. We know that, for example, um, we have introduced in the Department of Justice um, a penalty notice scheme which allows fixed penalties to be issued for a number of public order offences, including public drunkenness, disorderly behaviour and behaviour likely to cause a breach of the peace. 
I think in addition to that, um, community and safety partnerships are hugely important um, in terms of the work that they do. And their local plans do include measures and initiatives, including community safety wardens, educational programs, engagement and diversionary programs, as well as intergenerational programs to try to address local concerns in areas where antisocial behaviour is an issue. I call Gordon Dunn. I thank the Minister for her answer so far. <laughs> The Minister will be fully aware of the problem of group antisocial behaviour, especially within our town centres, and we look forward to the better as we look forward to the better weather with the longer summer evenings. Can the Minister therefore advise on what initiatives following the recent review that she will implement in trying to address the problem? Well, I think that the member highlights a particular issue that tends to happen with increasing um, warm weather, with more people spending time outside. It should be an opportunity for people to be able to enjoy the environment around them, but I think many of us will know and indeed will have had experience in his own constituency um, of the impact that um, drinking can have when it comes particularly um, to the enjoyment of the coast. Um, I think what we need to look at in terms of initiatives going forward is how we can work in partnership with others. There is an issue um, at the moment. The police don't have the power um, to be able to seize open canisters of alcohol um, or uh, open um, containers which previously contained alcohol. And there have been attempts um, in terms of legislation to address this. However, we have been advised that those attempts, if enacted, would not be successful and would not be effective um, in, tackling the, uh, in tackling the issue. So I think it is about collaborative working between the Department of Justice, the Department of Communities, um, and with local councils in order to ensure that we review the bylaws, we look at how they're implemented and enforced, um, and we also look to see where additional legislation might be necessary to provide them with the backup required. I think it's also important that we continue to work with others, um, including youth service, um, to try and de deflect young people away from what is um, risk-taking behaviour, because it is not only a nuisance to others um, in the community, it also places young people at risk um, of harm. It can place them in danger themselves and make them quite vulnerable. And so I think it's important that we try to take a proactive approach um, to ensure that young people are protected as, lo as well as local communities. I call Colin McGrath. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, nothing challenges antisocial behaviour more than police on the street challenging that behaviour. And there can be a perception at times that there are not enough police on the street or that they're never seen. There has been a promise of additional officers, especially the community beat team. I made reference to them yesterday. And can I ask again from the Minister when these new officers will be on the ground? Well, the deployment of police resources on the ground is a matter for the Chief Constable, and I think the question would be best directed towards him. Um, but yes, there are additional officers being made available, and the police have been clear to the policing board um, in their conversations with them that it would be their intention that that would be used in order to strengthen community policing teams, not just in order to tackle antisocial behaviour, but actually in order to help with cooperation um, within communities and to build the kind of strong relationships between police and the communities that are absolutely essential. Um, if we're to create a culture of lawfulness and also assist the police in the work that they do to keep people safe. Before I call the next member, I just want to say that questions 5 and 12 have been grouped. Uh, I call Paul Gavin. Question number three. The modernisation of the civil and family justice system is one of a number of significant reforms being progressed by the department. As the Gillen Review recognised, the civil and family justice system has not been subjected to fundamental change for some years, and substantial reform will take time and will require considerable contributions from a range of partners, including other departments and the judiciary. We have made a good start, though with limited resources. Our focus so far has been primarily on family law, and we've made good progress in a number of areas. This includes piloting a family drug and alcohol court, working in partnership to improve the experience of litigants in person in the court system and progressing legislation to protect victims of abuse from being directly cross-examined by the perpetrator in the domestic abuse bill. I intend to build on this good start over the coming months. I'll give him supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the progress being made, particularly uh, in respect to family law. One aspect uh, that I would like to see taken forward would be the issue around 
the standardised uh, fee approach around legal aid, which took place in criminal law, and it would be good to see that taking place on the civil side. Within the recommendations, Mr Speaker, made by uh, Gillan, uh, there was a, an area which he touched upon when it came to uh, how court cases were being communicated, access to the, the gallery for the public. Uh, and there were submissions that were made in respect of this aspect from the Bar Council, for example, that defendants should have the right to remain anonymous until the point of which conviction takes place. I would welcome the Minister's view. Is that an area that uh, she believes uh, should be taken forward by way of granting anonymity to defendants until the point in which they are uh, convicted and found guilty? Uh, otherwise, we look at the, the approach in terms of the Republic of Ireland, which they have taken in handling these types of serious sexual offences cases. Well, I think a bit like um, Claire Sugden suggested that the Department of Justice tends to be the place people go when things go wrong. I think Justice Gillen also became that person because you're actually referring to a second review um, that, that uh, Sir John Gillen did, and that was in respect of sexual offences and crimes. Um, in respect of that particular issue, um, there is the issue about anonymity. Clearly, we value the open and transparent nature of the court system, but it is important, I believe, that both victims and indeed those who are accused of crimes um, are given protection, particularly in those very sensitive areas. It is, a, it is a balanced conversation because there has also been evidence that where perpetrators um, and alleged perpetrators, names are made known that other victims will often then come forward and so to dis not disclose um, their name and to not disclose who they are can actually be a barrier to other people coming forward. So that is still under consideration by the department and no final decision has been made in that regard. Okay, I call Jim Allister. If the Minister is taking questions on the second review, could I ask her this? Uh, first of all, could I urge her not to rush to blind acceptance of everything that's in that report? Because I want to suggest to her that there's one aspect in particular, and maybe more than one, which sits very antithetically with a fair process in a trial. I'm referring to the suggestion that we should move to a point where cross-examination of an accused is subject to all questions being approved by the judge. Now, cross-examination is critical in separating the wheat from the chaff in a case. It cannot be scripted. It is answer-led and therefore should not be judge-led. So will she carefully consider the adverse impact on a fair judicial process if we got to the point where cross-examination was fettered in the way suggested? Well, I can first of all reassure um, Mr Allister that there is no intention on my part um, to rush to judgment without giving these issues um, careful consideration. The importance of a fair trial and a fair hearing is absolutely crucial and is at the heart of the justice system. There are, however, examples um, which people can refer to where people are asked questions which perpetuate r rape myths, for example, where people are questioned about their previous sexual behaviour, uh, where people are questioned about what they wore, um, myths that have I think we have spent a long time as a society um, trying to unpick. And I think in those cases, it is absolutely right in the same way um, that it would not be permitted in a job interview for people to make reference to people's family or carrying responsibilities, that we should have boundaries within which people can be questioned, particularly um, when it comes to questioning um, and cross-examining witnesses who in these cases may also be a victim of crime. So I think that it's important um, that those who are involved in these cases cases are trained specifically um, for that role. I think that includes those um, who are acting in defence of those who are accused, as well as those who are prosecuting in the system. Call Martina Anderson. Minister, can I ask you uh, primarily about the perpetrators in family courts um, and the proceedings that take place that allows for perpetrators to question victims, and I know you said you were going to ban that sometime soon, but have you a time frame for that? And also, would you have any policy specific to parental alienation? I know you said yesterday it's not going to be in the domestic finance bill, but will there be policy specifically because the DOS VITA project would be keen to hear if there would be policies relating to this? 
Well, I know that the member um, has been working um, with the Dulce Vita project for some time, and I appreciate very much they have also corresponded with me about their concerns. The issue of parental alienation, I think, is gaining in increasing recognition in the family courts. I think we also recognise that in cases where there is domestic abuse, um, particularly that of coercive control, um, that children can often be used and abused in those circumstances um, in order to affect some kind of ongoing control and contact with a victim which is unwelcome. And so I think it is important that those in the family court system are alert to the risks um, of people coming into contact with people in the family courts, whether that's as a result of stalking offences or whether it's as a result of domestic abuse. As I said to the member um, previously when questioned about this, the issue of domestic abuse will cover coercive control, and coercive control is, I think, parental alienation is a form of coercive control in a family, and it also will bring forward an aggregating factor to be considered um, around the issue of children being involved in those offences. And so I think that there is a real opportunity for um, issues around parental alienation to be dealt with in the domestic um, violence bill, whilst it's not listed as a specific offence. But I think raising awareness is also hugely important to those those who are working as justice partners in the system. Uh, I call uh, Alex Easton. Thank you. Question number four, Mr Speaker. I refer the member to the answer that I provided in response to his recent uh, written question by way of background. The prisoner's disclosure of information about victims' bill, known as Helen's Law in England and Wales, is currently before Parliament. It has been called Helen's Law as the outcome of a long-running campaign by Helen McCourt's mother. Helen was murdered in 1998 and her body was never recovered. And so her mother has campaigned um, to include provisions as a statutory duty um, on the parole board in England and Wales to consider the non-disclosure of victims' remains as part of its assessment of consideration of release of prisoners where the board believes that the prisoner has access to such information. Alex Eason, supplementary. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for her answer so far? Um, I understand that Charlotte Murray's family and Lisa Dorian's family have been in contact about trying to introduce uh, a possible law for Northern Ireland. Would the Minister agree with me that these families have been through far too much pain, suffering and anguish, and that those responsible for their murders, whether they've been convicted or will be in the future, should not be uh, getting out of jail until such times that they reveal where their loved ones are? Well, I thank the member um, for raising the issues, and I'm aware, obviously, of the tragic case um, of Lisa Dorian, and also have every sympathy with Charlotte Murray's, Murray's family. Um, and I'm aware of their desire to see the law changed, as is proposed for England and Wales. I'm meeting with uh, the family of Charlotte Murray soon, and will consider the issue further in light of the passage um, of the bill. I know that Sinead Corrigan, Charlotte's sister, has begun a campaign um, and has been very active in terms of petitioning, and has now over 3,000 signatures in support of that. I will hopefully be meeting them on the 11th of March, and then we'll be able to further consider whether or not um, such legislation is required in Northern Ireland. I call Linda Dillon. Welcome the Minister, confirming that she's meeting with families because I think that it's very important. I think you've been very proactive in, in your short time as Minister in terms of meeting victims in relation to all of these issues, and I think that only can be a positive thing. Just in relation to Helen's Law, obviously there, there is an element of it that is in relation to sentencing, and could that be, I suppose, encompassed in the sentencing review, possibly? Well, I think that there are a couple of things that I would want to say in terms of um, an issue where someone has been murdered and where um, sentencing takes place. Um, obviously, it's a matter for the judge to make a judgment on what they decide to do. But where they issue a life sentence, when they then make a tariff decision, they take account of circumstances in that individual case. And that would include any aggravating or mitigating factors, including impact on the family. And so aggravating factors can increase the length of tariff before which that's the term served before which you can actually apply for parole. And so I think that there is an issue in terms of considering that. In the case of um, Charlotte's murder, um, the judge, when he made his sentencing remarks, actually said that he, the devastating impact of the family not knowing where her body was, that he regarded this as the most serious aggravating feature of the case. And so it was taken into account in, sen in sentencing, and it is important um, that it continues to be so. Robbie Butler. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for answers so far. Um, the murderers of Captain Robert Narak, GC, are still on the run in the US. If Helen's Law is brought into Northern Ireland, can you confirm, if arrested, that these individuals would not be released under licence as per the Belfast uh, Agreement unless they give the location of Robert's remains? It would not be appropriate for me, first and foremost, um, to prejudge whether or not Helen's Law will be introduced because we haven't made a decision on that. It is still under consideration. I think when it comes to the issue of sentencing, um, the particular provisions in the 1998 Act um, are already set out. And I think it would be a matter for the Northern Ireland Office that would have to make changes to the 1998 Act in order to bring in what you suggest um, as part of the general um, sentencing guidelines. But I'm happy to write to the member um, with clarification on which particular pieces of legislation would apply in these specific circumstances, because I know that those cases would be treated um, under the 1998 Act. Uh, which led to um, early release of prisoners. Nicole, Patsy McGlone. Don't go to action. We have selection error to come out. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Thank the Minister for her answer so far. Just trying to tease out that issue of tariffs, and while you have said that it's for the judiciary to determine the tariffs, whether that be full life, but also there's the issue in question of parole, that a person who has been convicted of murder who hasn't disclosed the location of the, the murder victim's body that uh, that falls within the remit of DOJ as well. So can the minister advise if she will be prepared to either change the legislation in relation to the tariffs that are implemented by the courts, and secondly, the issue of parole, whether that question of parole it be not made available to persons who haven't disclosed the whereabouts of their, their victim's body in circumstances where they've been convicted of murder? Well, the member is correct in identifying that there are two places um, in the system where um, aggravating factors such as non-disclosure um, of victims' remains can be considered. The first is at the point of tariff setting, um, where the judge makes a decision as to the earliest point in a sentence where a life uh, prisoner can apply for parole. Obviously, um, that is often not the point at which they are released because there is a robust pre-release programme that people must go through and must pass pre-release testing um, before consideration. And so even if somebody has a tariff which appears to be quite short, they may end up serving quite a long sentence nevertheless if they fail those tests. The second, and that will be covered in terms of the sentencing review, there is the opportunity um, to look at the, more, the, the, the wider frame of sentencing. Um, we haven't reached conclusions with respect to the outcome of that, but those are the responses to the sentencing review are being collated and will be considered. In terms of the parole commissioner's view, in considering the, relation, um, considering the release of prisoners on licence, they will assess all of the information in relation to the offence and where a vic an offender has refused um, to reveal the location of the victim's remains, they would be able to take that into account. And that is already the case. Effectively, the legislation in England and Wales places our, currently paro our current parole board practice on a statutory footing, um, but it doesn't actually place a duty on the parole board to deny release until a person identifies the location of a victim's remains. It simply requires them to take it into account um, before they make a decision at what point to parole a prisoner. I call Daglan Magalier. A case to Rakhig. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I want to take questions 5 and 12 together. The recent consultation on sentencing included driving offences resulting in death or serious injury, including those as a result of careless driving while under the influence of drink or drugs. A number of questions were posed, including whether the current maximum of 14 years should increase to a maximum of life or 20 years. As mentioned on the 17th of February, in relation to a previous question, the consultation closed on the 3rd of February with over 200 responses received. The majority of those responses were received in relation to sentencing for serious driving offences. The responses are currently being analysed with a view to a report this spring. May I assist members if I make clear, however, that responsibility for road traffic legislation lies with the Department of Infrastructure. And questions about any wider review of sentencing for driving offences should be directed to the Minister for that department, Nicola Mullen. A wider policy review of sentencing for driving under the influence of drink or drugs would be a matter for her, and her, de her department would be responsible for developing policy in that area. 
Uh, Graham Morgan, and thank the Minister for her response. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to commend the family of uh, young Anna Dolan, who was killed um, in an accident um, a number of years ago, who had been campaigning rel relentlessly for appropriate sentence for those uh, people convicted of killing people in those circumstances. Could, would the Minister agree with me that it would be important that if there's any changes to come about in relation to sentencing, that the, that the punishment must fit the crime and act as a, a deterrent, particularly in situations where there's no remorse shown? Uh, uh, well, first of all, could I join with the member in paying tribute to the family of Enda Dolan? Um, I think that Enda's um, death um, is one that sticks in most people's minds. It was an absolutely horrific um, incident. Um, and I had the honour of spending time with the family recently when they came to meet me to discuss um, their concerns around the sentencing in that case and about how sentences are constructed. Their desire is to see sentencing as clear and open as, and transparent as possible and to ensure that victims' families can understand the sentencing, understand how it's calculated um, and be confident um, that the sentencing fits the crime. And I know that their concerns in relation to that are significant. They have already, and I would want to commend them for this, through their campaign and their feedback on their own experience, changed elements of the justice system. So, for example, now it is routine um, that families have the, the sentence described to them before they enter the court for the actual sentencing, so that families are not caught off guard, are not surprised, and are not confused um, by how the sentences are described in court, because it can be a very upsetting experience um, for families who are sitting in a confusing situation, a highly emotional situation, and then hear very complex explanations um, as to why the sentence has been arrived at. That ends the period for a list of questions, and we're moving on to topical questions. I call Patsy McGlone. If you would outline to me um, the nature of investment that you will be able to make in regard to community policing on the ground. Well, as the member is aware, the issue of investment in policing on the ground and the management of resources um, within the PSNI is entirely a matter um, for the Chief Constable. However, um, like all departments, um, I am currently in negotiations with the Finance Minister with respect to the settlement for the coming year, and that will include money um, for policing, which is a large part of my budget, around 70% of the, the Department of Justice's budget um, is spent on policing. But how that is dispersed um, and spent with in the police service is entirely a matter for the Chief Constable. Pass me along, supplementary. Thank, thank the Minister for her response. And, uh, could I just seek assurances from the Minister that, in fact, the amount of monies that she has sought for policing has been, uh, in some way, if you like, prioritised to be directed towards community policing and her engagement with the PSNI? Again, it is for the uh, Chief Constable to decide what the police's priorities are in terms of deploying their resources, but undoubtedly he is already on record in saying that he places huge emphasis on the need for enhanced community policing um, and good contact within communities. And so I would imagine um, that, dependent on resources, that is an area that he would want to expand upon, but it will be entirely a matter for him. And I call Gemma Dolan. Can the Minister outline her rationale for supporting the extension of the British Government's terrorist offenders restriction of early release bill to the North? There are a number of issues um, in terms of the early release bill. As you're aware, there was emergency legislation that was brought through um, in recent uh, weeks which Northern Ireland was not included in. I think that that sends out a potentially quite dangerous message that in some way uh, Northern Ireland, uh, there's a two-tier system when it comes to dealing with terrorist offenders. And I think that that places Northern Ireland and the public potentially at greater risk. However, in the development of the more long-term approach to this issue, because that bill was brought forward um, in response to a particular operational need, in response to um, in the development of the longer term legislation, the department officials continue to engage because whilst it would be our desire that we match um, best practice from other jurisdictions, it is also important um, that we have systems that are operable um, within the Northern Ireland context and that are sensitive to the Northern Ireland context also. Gemma Dolan. Thank the Minister for her answer. Um, human rights organisations have expressed grave concern at this law. Um, will the Minister take account of these concerns? 
I think issues around human rights are always at the top of our agenda when it comes to how we deal with people um, who are offending um, and how they are treated within the system. In particular, um, concern was expressed in terms of the emergency legislation and provisions about the retrospectivity of that um, in relation to sentences. Ultimately, the main duty in looking at these issues is around public protection, but I don't believe that public protection is aided if people um, are under the view and impression um, that people's human rights are being abused. So it is important that a correct balance is struck um, and that we give due consideration to all of the factors, um, including um, whether or not people's human rights are being respected in the system. I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you, sir. Given the devastating impact that stalking has upon victims, could the Minister provide the House with an update on the introduction of legislation to create an offence of stalking in Northern Ireland? Well, I thank the member for his question. As he will be aware, we have fallen somewhat behind um, some other jurisdictions with the issue of stalking, and so it would be my intention, um, based on the policy development that has taken place here so far, um, to introduce um, a stalking bill in the autumn. That would introduce a specific offence of stalking, um, and take into account um, the effect that multiple incidences will have on a person um, because at the moment that has to be prosecuted under harassment law and it can be quite difficult often for victims to meet the threshold. It will also introduce stalking protection orders um, which can be initiated by the police and therefore remove the burden that is often placed on victims under harassment law to seek non-molestation orders because those can become quite expensive and unwieldy and in fact uh, some victims have found um, that the perpetrators in those circumstances pursue them by trying to alter the non-molestation orders to maintain contact through the courts uh, with the victim of stalking. Mr. Stafford, I welcome the answer that the Minister has given and I am very grateful to her for it. Um, sexual harassment of women involving mobile phones has become an increasing problem in our society. Can the Minister outline some of the proposals that she has in order to tackle these outrageous assaults upon women in our society? Well, I thank the member for that, and I do think that it is important uh, on two fronts um, that we tackle um, online crime, um, and particularly the kind of assaults that the, the member talks about. Whether it's revenge porn or whether it's upskirting or anything else, I am committed to ensuring that the law provides the most effective protection for victims of this kind of crime. It's my intention to bring forward legislative proposals on a number of amendments to sexual offences law, including amendments on the law on voyeurism, which will make upskirting a specific offence. I want to bring that legislation to the Assembly in a justice bill, which we have planned for introduction in early 2021. I call Melissa McHugh. Minister, uh, as part of the domestic abuse bill being presented in Britain, um, there is a statutory authority to provide safe uh, accommodation for uh, survivors and victims um, of domestic abuse. Does the Minister intend to introduce a similar statutory duty here? The statutory duty in terms of providing accommodation currently falls to the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and would lie within the Department of Communities. So it's something that we would want to work in partnership um, with other parts of government in order to ensure that those who seek um, protection from domestic violence um, are able to secure accommodation. As the member will be aware, it can be a very traumatic experience for someone um, to be able to build up the courage to leave a relationship or to leave a home circumstance. And often, um, if they feel at the first hurdle, um, they will not pick up that courage and find that opportunity again. So it's absolutely vital the proper accommodation, but also wraparound support for victims and their families is provided in the first instance so that people can actually escape what are abusive and often very dangerous relationships. Supplementary, Melissa McHugh. And, Dr. Ratches, uh, thank you for your statement, Minister. And uh, is there an intention on your part or with the other departments as well too, to engage with Women's Aid? Women's Aid, um, the uh, Men's Advocacy Project, um, NIACRO um, and lots of other organisations, Nexus and others, um, are hugely important partners for us in terms of how we develop um, both the initial um, offences um, and the legislation, but also how we manage offenders um, after release um, to ensure that people are protected, um, both during the time when somebody is serving time for that offence, but also um, when, they're re, uh, when they're released back into the community. There is a huge amount of work, I think, that needs to be done in terms of upskilling first responders 
um, to be aware of the impact of stalking and domestic violence, and particularly to note um, the signs of coercive control at the earliest possible stage. And so there is training um, that is going on. And I think one of the things I referenced earlier in questions today was the need for that training to be comprehensive so that when we operationalise these offences, our justice partners um, are in a good place to be able to ensure that they're effective and provide the correct level of protection um, for people and for families in those circumstances. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. Um, when the UNC.UK inquiry happened here, their report recommended that we protect women from harassment by anti-abortion protesters by investigating complaints and prosecuting and punishing perpetrators. The recent NIO consultation on abortion regulations stated, therefore, that new powers may be required in Northern Ireland that allow for proactive designation of exclusion zones so that women, girls, access and services and health professionals working in the facilities can feel safe and secure and free from harassment and intimidation. Will the Minister be introducing these new powers to keep people safe? Well, I thank the member for a question, and it's very timely because I've actually raised this with the Northern Ireland office. It would be their responsibility under the recent um, executive formation bill um, to actually re to introduce um, such protections as part of their overall approach. Um, I think the member has been involved in this issue long enough to know that not everyone um, in this chamber, and indeed not all parties, would share um, her view when it comes to the issue um, of uh, protection zones around clinics. However, I have to say, uh, Mr Speaker, that I fundamentally believe that people, while they have a right to protest, do not have a right um, to interfere with people's ability to access services, um, to be able to travel back and forward to a clinic that is offering either advice um, or services, uh, medical services um, that are legal um, and permissible um, to patients. And I think that managing protest um, in a constructive way to allow people still to have the freedom of expression but not to interfere with others' free passage is absolutely crucial in this legislation being effective. Call Claire Bailey. And I thank the Minister very much for her answer. Um, can she let us know how many reports of anti-abortion protesters have been received to date in terms of harassment and intimidation and any numbers of subsequent investigations and prosecutions? Um, I would have to write to the member with the statistics for that. Um, I would also just mention, which I admitted um, in my original answer, um, that I did meet um, with Robin uh, Robin Walker, who is um, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State, um, to specifically ask him about this issue, which still falls um, to the Department of Justice remit in terms of how it would be implemented. As you know, with the decriminalisation of abortion, other regulations in that respect have moved um, to the direct lead of health. Um, however, the issue around exclusion zones and how those are policed and managed um, is one that would then fall to the Department of Justice in due course. I call George Robinson. Can the Minister give an update on the business case for the rebuild of McGilligan Prison in my constituency? Well, um, I would be delighted um, to do so, um, and I will be in a position, hopefully, um, to have it reinforced to me how important that is, because I will be visiting McGilligan tomorrow, um, and I'm hoping um, to be able to see uh, firsthand the work that is being done there. But, I mean, it has been brought to my attention um, already by the head of prison service just how important it is um, that the prison is um, substantially rebuilt, and that is one of the issues for which we have made capital um, bids in terms of being able to take that business case forward and develop proper plans um, that in due course the prison will be built. But we are absolutely committed to maintaining a prison at the site of McGilligan. George Robinson, supplementary. Thank the Minister for her answer. And would the Minister agree that both staff and inmates require the new prison after asbestos was found in prison bu buildings? Well, I think it's absolutely crucial um, that the prison estate is fit for purpose, and I think it also needs to reflect the kind of work that is now done within the prison system. It is no longer simply about locking people up, um, but it is about providing people with opportunities for rehabilitation, for education, for gaining new skills, and hopefully um, setting them on the right course so that we challenge them in the prison system to turn their lives around when they come out. And he is, of course, correct that it is also the working environment of those who work within the prison service, and therefore it's absolutely crucial um, that buildings are fit for purpose, but also um, that they are respectable buildings um, in which people feel proud of the work that they do. I call Sean Lynch. Can call you. Minister, 
Your uh, department piloted a domestic uh, violence perpetrator scheme in Derry. Within Derry courts, Woodrow suspended because of uh, uptake. Now, we have told in April last year that there will be more research done than this. Can the Minister update us where this is at? I'm afraid that I don't have an update for the member at this point in time, but I'm happy to get one and write to him with it. Supplementary, Sean Lynch. Um, the Department has funded the Probation Board Minister to deliver a pilot behavioural change programme for individuals who sh show concerning behaviours but has not reached the criminal justice system. Can the Minister outline any plans she has for further rollout of this programme? Well, the, the programme to which the member refers is a pilot scheme in order to test how effective it is. I think it, it certainly in the early stages it appears to be working well in that those who have not been, if you like, um, forced to take um, these corrective courses are much more open um, to engaging with the system um, than those, for example, who are offered it as part of their sentence and um, their sentencing structure. I think in terms of the rollout of that, I think we need to wait until the full assessment of that pilot has been done, but undoubtedly it is something that we need to look at because what we want to try to do is deflect as many people away from the justice system, away from offending as possible, and if we can help people to build better patterns of relationships, to build safer um, family units, and to be able to take care of each other um, more appropriately, then I think that that is for the good of everybody concerned. Time is up. We move on to the question to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Just to say, the questions six and eight have been grouped. And I call Pat Sheehan.